Hello, good morning and namaste. I hope all of you can hear me. Uh, I am Surya Kumar Marjan, Nepal representative of Asia, this Association for Tropical Biology and Conservation, Asia Pacific chapter. Firstly, let me welcome you all the participants and our four distinguished speakers in this morning session of the Asia pa Association for Tropical Biology and Conservation 2021 Asia Pacific side event. We will start this morning session with a panel discussion on human wildlife conflict and conclude it with ATBC Asia Pacific chapter virtual annual meeting. So feel free to join the annual meeting and the afternoon session. Now moving on to the panel discussion on human wildlife conflict. When the parts of human and charismatic megafauna such as tiger, elephants, and leopard cross due to the regions inflicted by human, such as deforestation and changes in land use, both sides, both the humans and the wildlife get suffered. Managing such human wildlife conflict is an ongoing challenge in tropical biodiversity conservation in Asia. To highlight the nature and the extent of some of these key human wildlife conflict in Asia Pacific region, here we have with us today, Chief Conservation Officer Bardia National Park, Nepal, Mr. Bishnu Prasad Sresta from Nepal, Conservation Scientist, Lead Environmental Specialist at the World Bank and former Director General, Department of Wildlife Conservation, Sri Lanka, Dr. Sumit Kilapetia from Sri Lanka, scientist at Wildlife Institute of India and adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia and at the same time, ATBC Asia Pacific Chapter India representative, Dr. Ramesh Krishnamurthy from India. And last but not the least, conservation practitioner and ATBC Asia Pacific Chapter Malaysia representative Ms. Aida Ghani from Malaysia. This panel discussion will last for an hour and I would like to request the speakers to limit their talk to 10 minutes so that we have last 20 minutes for the open discussion. And their participants, I would like to request you to raise questions in between. And if you have any questions, feel free to write it down in a chat box or if you prefer, you can save it till the end and then ask it verbally at the end. So during this 20 minutes discussion, and also whenever, when you are writing your question in chat box, please indicate the name of the speakers whom you want to direct your question to. And now, without any further delay, I would like to request Mr. Bishnu Prasad Sresta, Conservation Officer, Bardia National Park, to give his talk. Mr. Bishnu, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Surya, a distinguished panelist, moderator, and virtually connected all friends. Very good morning and namaste to all. I am Vishnu Prasad Sreshtra, working as a Chief Conservation Officer in Bardia National Park, Nepal. Welcome you all on my presentation, Human Tiger Conflict in Bardia National Park. I would like to start my presentation. Not working, Surya. Nepal is very rich in biological diversity due, due to its climatic and geographical variation. More than 118 ecosystem and 35 forest types with 70 vegetation are found. More than 44% of the country's land is covered by the forest and more than 30% of the forest land is managed by the community, is a community forestry program. Similarly, more than 23% of the country's land is covered by the protected area. Protected area are widely distributed throughout the country from Tarai region to mountain. We do have about 20 protected area under this system. Tarai Arc landscape is the first conservation landscape and designed for based on the tiger dispersal model. In this landscape, we do have uh, six protected areas. Tigers are widely dis distributed across the Tarai and Suri region of this landscape. It includes 
the six protected areas in Nepal and 10 protected areas in India. So we call Tarai Art Landscape is a transboundary landscape. Tal is a global priority conservation landscape for the tiger conservation. Now I like to go on the Bardia National Park. Bardia National Park is the largest national park in Tarai region of Nepal, covering an area of 968 core area and buffer zone is 507 square kilometers. It is a home to many endangered species like a tiger, rhino, elephant, a crocodile, dolphin, and so on. It is the best place to see the tiger in the wild. Nepal has a long history of tiger conservation since 1973 by the establishment of the Chiton National Park. Since then, Nepal has established additional food protected areas that is Bursa, Baki, Bardia, and Suklafanta for the tiger conservation. Since 2010, the number of tiger is increasing. According to our last survey carried out in 2018, we do have 235 tigers in Nepal. I hope Nepal will be the first country to double the tiger by 2022. We can see the tiger number in different protected areas of Nepal. According to the last survey of 2018, we do have 18 tigers in Bardia National Park. We do have an intact habitat, more than 3,500 of poor protected area and 2000, more than 2,000 square kilometer of buffer zone in Tarai and Sure region. The tiger density is high in Bordia National Park, that is four in individual, uh, sorry, that is five individual per 100 square kilometers. Similarly, we do have uh, abandoned prey species. The prey density is high in Bordia National Park, that is 78 individuals per square kilometers. Now I would like to talk on human tiger country. Tiger is an icon for the wildlife conservation. It is an apex predator and umbrella species that ensure the well-being of all ecosystem across its habitat. Growing human tiger country is one of the most threatening obstacles in wildlife conservation. Generally, human tiger country is the interaction between the human and tiger with its consequential neg negative impact on human and their resources. It is predominantly due to the local people's heavy pressure on forest resources, habitat degradation or shrinkage, and increase in the tiger population as well. It is generally expressed in three forms. First one is tiger attack on human, and second one is tiger attacks on the livestock, and third one is threats to the human safety from the tigers. Now I like to talk on problem tigers. General assumption is that when a population increases, conflict also intensified. In Nepal, protected areas are typically surrounded by the buffer zone with the marginal habitats with a human high density. Generally, young tigers cannot compete with the resident uh, tigers. So younger tigers are often pushed out from the poor areas into the buffer zone. Similarly, older and weaker male tigers are also driven from that territory by the dominant females so that these younger tigers and older post-productive tigers living in a marginal habitat are the most likely to come in conflict with humans. This is the scenario of the bird, <coughs> no, human wildlife conflict or human tiger conflict in Bardia National Park. In 2002 to 2006, only four human deaths by tiger. Between 2007 and 2018, there is no human death from the tiger attacks. But since 2019, human death is increasing. In 2019, six, and 2027, and 2021 till date is six persons. Altogether, 19 persons are died from tiger attack within a two and a half years. This is very challenging to manage the human tiger conflict in Bardia National Park. One thing is that all these incidents were occurred in the forest area, not in a settlement. Similarly, livestock depredation is increasing since 2017. This is the aggregated data of livestock damage or livestock kill by the tiger. 
and livestock uh, or leopard as well. Now I like to talk on the action against the problem tigers that we have taken. Uh, before that, uh, another uh, country is Hayekil. Uh, about 30 kilometers of the East West Highway passing through our uh, Bordia National Park, which fragments the major habitats of the wildlife, including uh, the tiger and other species. You can see the red line in the map. This is the East West Highway passing through the Bordia National Park. Within the last five years on human death by the tiger and two tiger death from the vehicle in that segment area. This is the map of human casualty in protected areas of Bordia National Park. A red circle represents the human death and green circle represents the human injury. Now I like to talk um, the action taken by us against the problem tigers. Managing human tiger conflict is very challenging job. I, it is not easy to identify the problem tigers as well. To monitor the problem tigers, we deploy our camera. After identification, we capture the problem tigers. In Bordia National Park, within the last two years, six tigers were captured. Out of six, five tigers kept in a, our enclosure or rescue center and zoo, and one released in a poor area of the Bordia National Park, because this one was the livestock killer and safety threats only. And one tiger was killed by the local people is a retaliate killing. Based on our observation, we can conclude that physical condition and territorial behavior are the major important factors related to the problem tigers, but age and sex had no significant effect. The transient and physically impaired tigers are more likely to be involved in conflict compared to the territorial and healthy one. Now I'd like to share some intervention that we have taken to minimize the human tiger conflict in Bordia National Park. Uh, first one, one is the public awareness is the main important step to mitigate the Conflict. We have given the high priority for raising awareness of the tiger ecology and behavior among the local community. We have also constructed some of the physical barriers like meshwire fencing. Particularly, meshwire fencing is for the wild boar and other deer species. It also creates the barriers for the tiger as well. We have also provided some support for predator proof pens and livelihood options for the local community. We have also created the revolving form to support the local people as well. Now, similarly, habitat management is the crucial for the tiger conservation. So we, we have the given priority for the habitat management, especially on grassland and water holes. And we, we do have also the relief scheme for the victim's family. We provide 1 million Nepalese rupees for the human death and all expenses for the human injury and up to 30,000 for livestock degradation. Similarly, we have prepared the human wildlife conflict mitigation and management strategic plan by consulting and involving all concerned stakeholders. Our main aim is to create the harmony between wildlife and human and maintain the coexistence between them. Hope we will be success in our achieving goal. Thank you so much from my side. Thank you, Surya. Thank you, Mr. Bisnu Prasad Shrestha, Chief Conservation Officer, Bardia National Park, Nepal. Thank you very much for your insightful talk. And we are delighted to hear that Nepal is going to meet its target to double the tiger number by 2022. But at the same time, we feel sad that the number of conflict incidences are increasing and it's becoming more challenging in the recent year. So with that, uh, for now, we conclude your talk. And I would like to invite next Dr. Sumit Pilapitiya from Sri Lanka to give his talk. Dr. Sumit, now the floor is yours.
Yo estoy dado en medio este. Uh, Dr. Sumit, we can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, very good now. Sorry. Uh, as I said, uh, in Sri Lanka, we are trying to move from a situation of a conflict into coexistence. Uh, if you take I'm sorry, I can't get the slides to move now. Ivan, can you help Dr. Sumit to get the slides moving? Uh, can you try to stop sharing and, and share again, Dr. Sumit? Can you see my slides? Yes. Uh, so we have uh, elephants in about two thirds of the country. And if we take the situation in Sri Lanka, uh, we have around 6,000 elephants in the wild. While Sri Lanka doesn't have the highest number of Asian elephants among the 13 Asian elephant rain states, we have the highest density of elephants. And unfortunately, to couple with that, we have a very high human population density of uh, excess of about 3,000 persons per square kilometer. So with very high densities of humans and elephants, interaction between them is obvious and conflict is inevitable. Therefore, uh, as, uh, as a result, Sri Lanka has the highest human elephant conflict among the Asian elephant rain states. Uh, in trying to manage the conflict in Sri Lanka, we have been trying to confine elephants only to Department of Wildlife Conservation protected areas in Sri Lanka. This strategy has been adopted for 60 years. By successive governments, we've been always trying to do this. And if this strategy, after having adopted it for 60 years, had it worked, we should be having less conflict rather than more conflict. When we look at the situation with annual human deaths due to the human elephant conflict, we see deaths increasing. If you take data over the last 10 years, it keeps increasing. For the first time, we exceeded 100 human deaths in 2019, and it seems a similar trend uh, now. When it comes to the annual deaths of elephants due to the conflict, that is also showing a similar trend with uh, we were having about a 250, 260 elephant average till about 200, 2017. Then there was a sudden spike to excess of 300 elephants in 2018. And now uh, 405 elephants in 2019. The number of elephants died in 2020 reduced a little bit because of the lockdowns due to COVID. But uh, because there were no interactions between humans and elephants. But this year, we are averaging one, almost one elephant a day being killed, and the conflict is going to get uh, uh, aggravated during the dry season, which is we are just embarking on that. So when we look at the elephant and uh, distribution in Sri Lanka, uh, an organization called the Center for Conservation and Research, CCR, did a study, uh, divided the entire country into 25 square kilometer grids, and uh, did a survey on the presence and absence of elephants. The areas in red are human dominated areas. There are only humans, no elephants, so there is no conflict. The areas are in green are the wildlife protected areas, which there are only elephants and no humans. So obviously there is no conflict there as well. But the areas in yellow are areas where humans and elephants share the same landscape. And that is where the conflict is. So we see that a large area of the country has elephants. So the strategy of Sri Lanka trying to drive all the elephants outside the protected areas in that yellow area into the protected areas is like taking elephants in this area, which is we, I have marked as red here. And we have an area in green, which is the protected area. And we are trying to drive all these elephants into the protected area and enclose them in. What we 
haven't realized and we are beginning to realize now is the fact that protect, these protected areas have been in existence for uh, hundreds of years. The elephant uh, population in these protected areas are at or near their carrying capacity right now. So by trying to drive new elephants in to this area is like trying to pour water into a glass that is already full. It cannot be done. So a change in strategy is absolutely necessary. And that is what we've been looking at in Sri Lanka at this point. We find electric fences to still be the most effective deterrent to keep humans and elephants separate. But we have been located, the, the critical aspect is where you locate the electric fence. Many times we locate fences on administrative boundaries of protected areas. Unfortunately, animals don't, elephants don't understand administrative boundaries of human beings. Elephants travel on ecological boundaries. So electric fences will be effective only if the electric fence is located on the ecological boundary, regardless to the ownership of the forest edge. Because it is not a boundary demarcation, it is to keep elephants and humans separate. So fences should be located at, on ecological boundaries. Then we should focus on protecting what needs protection. Electric fences don't protect elephants. Electric fences protect people, property, and crops. So shouldn't we be fencing what we want to protect rather than fencing forests to keep elephants in? So we are taking an approach in Sri Lanka of trying to introduce community-based village fences and what we call seasonal agricultural fences. Going back to the topic of ecological fencing, what we are doing is the, the top section is wildlife department conservation areas. The surrounding green area is other forest areas, sometimes belonging to the forest department of Sri Lanka or some other government organizations or even private forest. So we are now recommending that the fences, electric fences should be relocated to the boundary of forest, regardless to the ownership, the boundary between forest and development, where the ecology changes, because that will, the elephants are risk averse. If they are coming close to uh, developed areas, they are much more uh, careful than when they are uh, when they are facing a fence in a forest. So fences should be relocated to ecological boundary, and we have uh, worked with communities to erect fences surrounding the community, surrounding the village. So the community gets involved in identifying the fence line, and they play a role in erecting and maintaining the fence. So which maintenance of electric fences have been a big problem when we have it in the forest. But here, since it surrounds the villages and it's very close to the village houses, the peripheral houses, villages are involved in uh, maintaining the fences, right? And we have tried this in about 60 villages and the communities and elephants are living in relative harmony. And some of these fences have been in operation for over 10 years now. And these were pioneered by this organization called CCR. And now the government also is getting into trying to introduce community fences. Then we have large paddy tracks in Sri Lanka, not each paddy field, but I'm talking about the paddy tract, where we come up with a seasonal temporary electric fence around the paddy tract. Once again, we use the community, the farmer organization to get involved in uh, erecting the fence around the paddy tract. These are temporary fences because paddy, paddy cultivation is seasonal in Sri Lanka. It has two seasons and there's a large fallow period of several months in between. If we have a permanent fence and when the land lies fallow, there are no farmers on the land at that time, you encourage elephants to learn to break fences and come to eat the crop residue. So here we get the farmers involved in, uh, as soon as the crop is harvested, they remove the fence and take it off allowing elephants to come and eat the crop residue. So it's a coexistent model for elephants as well. The elephants get to use the crop residue after the farmers have cultivated their crops and they take the fences away and re-erect it during the next cultivation season. And this is pretty, can be done pretty fast because in a day, the farm organization can erect such a fence around their paddy tract. So the critical thing when you are doing 
this approach of community fencers, the community fencers should not be facilitated by the wildlife conservation agency. Because community fencers, we are dealing with the community. And if we are dealing with the community, we are dealing with uh, people. The conservation agency's objective is conservation. So we should try to work with the uh, agencies that deal with communities to uh, facilitate the fences with the communities taking ownership to do it. So this model has been recommended for nationwide implementation by a presidential committee that was appointed by the uh, president of Sri Lanka to develop a national human elephant conflict mitigation action plan. So we are hoping that it will be upscaled nationwide. We also look at trying to get communities to benefit from elephants because right now elephants are an economic liability to communities. If there are any ways we can get communities involved in elephant viewing tourism in areas outside the protected areas, particularly in these paddy tracks, once you remove the fences for a couple of weeks, two, three weeks, it's guaranteed sightings of elephants. Then, and the community organizations can earn revenue from tourism, we come to a position of um, uh, people want seeing elephants as an economic asset to them. And if we have a conservation strategy, such as a landscape approach, like I had suggested, that will benefit people and elephants both, I think we are heading towards coexistence with elephants. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sumit, for a very insightful talk. And we are really impressed by the high density, the presence of high density elephants in Sri Lanka. And uh, we are also impressed to see that map where you showed the core areas where you, which are allocated for the protection of these elephants and the areas where the conflict is going on and the community involvement that you are trying to get to minimize this conflict, ongoing conflict is really impressive. And, and we are also happy to learn that it is working very well and it's uh, leading towards like win-win situation. So with that note, I would like to invite next uh, Dr. Ramesh Krishnamurti from India uh, for his talk. Uh, Dr. Ramesh Krishnamurti, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you, Surya. Uh, it's it's a very nice to be part of this. Um, so greetings to all the participants in this important meeting. And also my gratitude to the, the previous speakers. I think they've kind of uh, provided an overview of uh, what's going on both in the country and also a uh, very gentle. So in my talk, um, I'm not going to be sharing the slide. I just try to uh, keep the slide in the background and uh, talk to you because of the bandwidth. So I think my talk is going to be focused on uh, the human leopard conflict in India. Uh, but then uh, when you talk about uh, India, I think many of you know, it's much, much diverse country with a lot of biodiversity. Similarly, we also have diverse problems. But then when you deal with uh, human uh, no leopard conflict, I think some of the important thing that we need to really understand is because even for the overall conservation setting, these issues like human leopard conflict, even otherwise even wildlife conflict becomes a key driver of the conservation agenda. So earlier, I think uh, just now, uh, I think Dr. Smith mentioned about how the conservation agency and uh, you know, the community agency work, but what is ha happening now? I mean, probably starting with India, maybe it's happening in other countries too. The human leopard conflict, it's, it's kind of forcing us to kind of keep it as a one of the conservation agenda. And uh, people engagement is going to be a, a major action uh, when it comes to even general wildlife conservation. So I think that is the background I wanted to kind of give um, to kind of focus how the conflict itself is an important conservation issue to focus, not just for the issue alone, but even for a general you know, su su long-term sustainability. But in India, I think human wildlife conflict has been recognized as one of the major threats to wildlife. Okay, so we can just refer to the working group on wildlife, ecotourism, animal welfare, and it's one of the important themes uh, identified in the twelfth uh, five-year plan. And and very recently, it's one of the major chapter of India's national wildlife action plan. So that talks volume of uh, what the major issue is. So in addition to leopard, I think we have uh, other species uh, which are prone to conflict. Sometimes these species cause conflict alone or sometimes it's uh, combined, like Asian elephant, tiger, we have a, a sloth bear, snow leopard also is a conflict species in India. 
in addition we have herbios like um, nail guy is a major species wild bow wild pigs uh, another uh, species uh, macaque so we have uh, these uh, co you know, combination of species sometime they contribute more to this uh, issue so le human le elephant conflict is uh, uh, a major one because uh, it's a it's a severe, severe issue so particularly uh, coming to the human death because other issues uh, but it's crop dying other things can be handled but uh, when it comes to human death um, it, it's much difficult to deal um, so elephant is one species and you want to manage them uh, we had struggling because uh, i mean we can talk about coexistence we can talk about early warning but uh, it it requires much larger uh, kind of efforts both from a policy level as well as from action and we also need uh, advanced tools and technology to deal with this so that's a very very recurring problem um, particularly in, uh, in the northern part of india and some part of uh, southern india too so tiger again it's uh, our um, important species in india as you know that holds about um, 70% of global population but uh, what we also know um, the the conflict is actually causing uh, 50% Uh, of the states in, in terms of population decline so conflict is is a major species uh, in terms of keeping the species together i would say that uh, no it's coming to this the major portion of my discussion with, with respect to rest leopard because leopard is a very very adaptable species very complex and in terms of its population i mean you have very difficult choices to make so when it comes to some of the rare species if they cause conflict we tend to deal separately but when it comes to species like leopard which is widespread and not only that i think there is a kind of this this the line separating the wilderness and civilization is getting increasingly blurred so partly because this invasion of human habitation into the natural areas and also the kind of attraction these leopards have so because the continuum is getting blurred is most of them time the peripheries you can't really deal with it so of course the animals do have the behavioral plasticity they can handle uh, they can have a wider prey base they can adapt but i think human behavior is also very important to take a note here because we have some evidences why where the animals do have a tendency to adapt or manage or try to avoid human whereas the human do not behave the same way that's partly why we have a large number of uh, the conflict incidences so that's very much applicable to leopard not just india i think it's applicable everywhere where it occurs so there's a lot of research that's happening in fact uh, we look at issues of uh, dealing with uh, fences translocation and compensation all those actions are there but still the problem is continuing see one of the thing that we really need to understand is that we have a conservation agenda where we try to promote or uh, recover habitat you know increase the population see like once we wanted the tiger number we maybe want to the population of the bird elephant but at the same time we also need to understand uh, the also going to cause conflict it's a kind of double edged sword so while your population may be increasing but the increase itself will lead to conflict the conflict then you know kind of feed back into a negative response where people are going to cause decline directly or indirectly so i think human wildlife conflict or human leopard conflict needs to be looked at from a much larger perspective than what we have been looking at as a species specific problem it is not a species specific problem anymore it's a large conservation problem and larger societal problem so human leopard conflict in india has been around you know about you know, if you can put it like an average of 200 cases i mean we've been having it i mean it's is on the slower side because most of the conflict are not even reported so this is what you see is a tip of the iceberg but the lot of issues people are facing very quietly when situation is out of hand then only things are getting noticed or people cannot afford it so we've been having this uh, conflict cases um, very regularly in fact if you look at uh, the population as you know in india this uh, leopard population actually is increased by 60% so we are talking about 12000 to 14000 leopards in india now um with the, some of the states in central india and southern india um having a maximum number um, but the problem is the other side we also been losing on an average uh, we been losing about you no know, 5200 leopards uh, uh, to kind of conflict 
and there are many deaths. If, if you put the deaths together, there are an average of 350 leopards are being lost, of which poaching alone contributes to 150. So you can imagine the kind of uh, the issues going around. While we may be happy about the number increasing, the other side, the number getting declined. In fact, very often it is said a leopard is one species uh, which is quietly being vanished. Uh, and then people probably not even having this remorse because of this, uh, the conflict that they have. Yeah, so I think uh, the nutshell that I wanted to talk about, the conservation is more to do with the people, okay? Because protection, yes, we can deal with it, but because the interfaces that is getting blurred and uh, more and more uh, resource extraction is being you know, promoted. So we need to really understand that because the people involvement is there. If, if any conservation effort needs to succeed, we really need to deal with the local communities. Um, but uh, the local community support is invariably lost due to conflict. So you know now what is the major area we all need to work with because most of the conservation cost is borne by the local communities because they're helpless in many situations. So they have different way of dealing with it because they may not have these resources to uh, kind of deploy. They take their own traditional way of handling. Sometimes there's a poisoning that can be directed. There's so much of issues going on in India. So, but then the, 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 the crux of the matter is, if you don't deal with the community as gentle through the contact management strategies, uh, we will be uh, losing so much of it. So we've been seeing this, and people, I mean, a lot of, I mean, if you go to the social media, um, many pictures go viral where animals are being chased by people at the same time animal killing people. I mean, all sorts of things that you actually see. But what are the key drivers of conflict? If you look at it, I think I would put in three points. One is the landscape con configuration change. The land, the interface areas, as I mentioned, are increasing with a significant impact for people and animal. And the biological and socioeconomic imperatives, because the intrinsic characters of animals and livelihood concerns of people pushes the boundaries of threshold and manifest into push factors and pull factors. Attitude and behavior of people and animals, individual based on population level behavior responses determine the consequence of human wildlife interactions. Because we really need to understand where individual level issues are there, where the population level issues are there. So to deal with it, I think this, the whole uh, issue need to be understood from this biological drivers and socioeconomic drivers, you know, and sometimes this political drivers. So these two uh, major driver actually determine the human wildlife conflict, understanding there by its resolution. So in terms of uh, the behavior, we have seen enough examples in India um, that animals tend to adapt uh, both spatially and temporally. It's a human behavior that calls for interventions. We really need to understand that you know, in which situation, which time human behavior in the interface areas need to be limited. These evidence is emerging. So we, we know that you know based on studies uh, through camera trap and telemetry, we understand these animals are uh, managing the human. In fact, in India, we've been monitoring uh, leopard through uh, camera traps in large parts of the country. And recently, we've been uh, putting GPS telemetry and we could actually see, even when you translocate, these animals actually come back. So if the translocation itself is an important strategy, where you translocate, what animal you translocate, where do you do them? Because if you don't do it in a planned manner, it can, it can itself can be a, a problem, more problem. But if you do in a very planned manner, the animals do manage. But then what we noticed was, even if you translocate, these animals do come back to this natal area. So you really need to understand this uh, particular issue and monitor very regularly. So behaviorally and temporally, uh, these animals uh, uh, kind of tend to avoid, but uh, human don't. So I'm just going to conclude by stating that what kind of conflict management situation that we need to deal with it. So one of the situations, the crisis situation, we really have to put all the words together and do whatever that we need to do, including translocation, removal, all that might happen. Then short-term solutions and situations, and then become short-term uh, solutions and long-term situations. So I think if you understand these three situations, it might be easier for us or not. I won't say easier. It's probably better to deal with uh, the human wildlife conflict than what we've been able to do. So some of the methods that uh, we can deploy is a physical uh, deployment where fences, biological methods where we try to really see if the population can be looked at, psychological methods, there are technological methods, including early warning system. So in nutshell, I mean, the human leopard conflict in India is much complex, but at the same time, if you understand the situations um, in a sequential manner or in a strategic manner, I think the resolution could also be uh, accordingly directed. 
so thank you for this opportunity uh, i think uh, we can discuss more uh, during the the discussion part of this or during the question answer thank you of course dr dr ramesh and thank you very much for your nice talk and thank you very much for highlighting the complexity of human wildlife conflict that we are facing in this region and also for highlighting uh, the need of focusing not only on the biological aspects but also take into account the social and the political aspects of the conflict for its uh, better management and also highlighting the possibility of using modern technologies to manage the ongoing conflict uh, with that note uh, now i would like to invite the next last but not the least for today's session uh, ms aida uh, ghani for her talk uh, we have talked about elef uh, a tiger elephant and leopard just now and now we will be moving back again to human elephant conflict aida the floor is yours All right. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay. So it's in the presentation mode, right? Okay. Uh, my name is Haida, and I represent him from Ethiopia. And going to share you about human elephant conflict lesson learned from Malaysia. I will actually I will share on my research, uh, my master research on uh, in conducting a human elephant conflict with the largest producer of sustainable palm oil company. Okay, as an introduction, I would like to bring you all to a daily life of yourself, whether or not that you are aware that every one of us is using palm oil in your company. Even when you shower, when you brush your teeth, when you feed your cat, when you have your cereal, when you wash your dishes and then after that when you wash your veggie and get your cup of coffee so everything when you do in your whole life whether or not you're aware you are consuming palm oil but um is um i see the current uh trending later i'll explain why i start with palm oil and then i go into malaysia context so basically um whether or not we realize we use palm oil product and as in, as from the country of malaysia we uh, malaysia is the second big second largest producer of palm oil. And if we combine with Indonesia, we actually uh, produce uh, or pro produce or provide more than 80% of supplies for the uh, palm oil products. And um, if I, I also aware of some of you, uh, some of the consumers uh, prefer to boycott the product, but actually boycott is not a solution where it's allow the other land use to be changed to other crops that's still not going to stop deforestation, which is which is not going to solve the, um, any problem. So if we look at the world trend, palm oil production actually has increased in the past 50 years. In 1970, we produced only 2 million, but uh, in 2018, it has increased to 7 million tons. And the rise of palm oils follows with the re increased rapid demands. And it's not just demand, it's, it follows with the human population in, in, in general. So basically the more the more people in this world, the more that we need, the more that we need to produce and the more waste that we're gonna generate. And like I said, Malaysia is the second leading producer. And um, as the as my research uh, carried out in the largest producer of sustainable palm oil, I would like to say I would like to present some of the keynotes that uh, I found in the research. So the research is basically, uh, the aim is to promote and support coexistence. Like I think uh, Dr. Sumif also mentioned about coexistence and, and uh, uh, now uh, doing, uh, the community also uh, drive their own uh, mitigation like the trade fence, yes. So this one is uh, focusing only on one crop. I see in the Dr. Sumif we have paddy, we have any other crop, but this one focusing on oil palm because oil palm in Malaysia is very, very important. Like I was mentioned earlier in the introduction, it, provide a uh, generate economy for the poor people as well. And it's, uh, it's driven the economy for Malaysia. And uh, in the objective of my research earlier, is actually I, I the, the main that I want to present here is the trend, like to understand the trend, how, what, how, what, and 
when elephant go to the plantation, what's actually the conflict in the plantation? So when you understand the conflict, then only you can create what mitigation is suitable for the conflict that you're facing. Because you cannot just generalize the mitigation to the conflict. And also, um, I will briefly show the effectiveness of the current HEC that's been implemented at the site and see a little bit about the policy and uh, uh, whatever that have in the company. So the, the, the research area is basically in Sabah. I think uh, uh, some of you may be aware of this area is in Borneo. In, uh, uh, it's about 40 kilometer uh, horizontal distance from the Kinabatangan. And another area is in Kuna, which is uh, near to the, if you're aware of Bukit Tawau Hill. So it's, it's, this is uh, one of the area, research area is not bordering to forest reserves, not bordering to protected areas, but there is a main groove on this site, which is not uh, a natural habitat of uh, elephant, elephant roaming from uh, this area. And uh, this area, elephant actually from this, uh, this side and then coming from this side. So basically what we're looking, uh, what we're looking or what we analyze from this plantation, okay, this is some of the image because I think it's quite nice to see the image. Some of the image of elephant that exists in the estates that I conduct the research. So you can see at some point, you can see actually they show lots of uh, social, social uh, behavior, they, they show their affection, they show the, which is, is quite similar with the human, like they have a whole family structure where they, they have mother, father and babies, and they have uh, man, many of them at the same time eating and show their, but in plantation, every 25 years, they have to replant things. So along, um, along these 25 years, when, do, when they fell in the replanting from oil palm to oil palm, this is the most uh, favorite time of uh, elephant to festive, like elephant all in the protected area come out and come to the plantation or communities area to come. Because I think it's the smells of the trunk when they fell in, and it's just like a festive. This, 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 is, the, this is one of the stage I think in future that could be potentially coexistent with the, with the, uh, with the a good arrangement that you can allow at the first when you fell in, elephant can come and eat whatever they like, like festive for the elephant. And then after that, what gonna be a conflict is when uh, when they started uh, the all the uh, all the all the felling palm is dry and then they started to plant the oil palm. And this is the time when elephant like to eat. So elephant come and damage and this is can cause a lot of damage to the palm oil. If the company is big enough, they basically um, has no problem to accommodate the loss, although it costs a millions, but if it happens to the communities and small holders, it's quite um, not bearable and not tolerable, which can cause or lead to the mitigation, uh, not just mitigation, but retaliation by the communities. So when we try to understand what actually the favorite uh, food, when elephant come and eat, what, what age of oil palm that they actually goes to. So from, from all of our data, if you can see the number of data of damage is 166 trees, standing trees. Actually 99% what they consume or eat is basically below five years. So which is maybe because of the uh, height of the palm, but it's uh, the, the, the young palm. And then 54% is basically the, the age of one and two. So you so as, um, as a researcher, this is the information that important that you tell the farmer or whoever that planted, this is the favorite. This is the time. So you understand this. Whenever you plant at this age, they love it. Okay. And this will help the farmer to uh, get the um, uh, mitigation, how, what to do with this mitigation. But I would like to show you because I show you the two uh, research sites. So the second research site is direct border with the uh, forest reserve. And they also have um, um, a nature component that maybe make a different result from what we try to understand. So at this plantation, they have um, matpo. Matpo is basically uh, from the uh, old paper, like the other research paper, it shows like elephant in here, they used to eat and uh, cool down themselves in this matpo because uh, of their thick skin, right? And then uh, as a herbivore as well, they get the salt lake from this matpo. So occasionally they came and 
bathing and all. But the problem is when they bath and enjoy this area, sometimes they start. So uh, uh, the plantation people or the communities around need to help or supply and get them out from the area. So it happens many times actually in this plantation that I visit. It happens many times in Samdabi and then we, we have to evacuate. And then again and again, until I think recently in 2021 as well, we have we still have uh, to evacuate the elephant from the from the mudpool. And then um, from, at this estate, we try to see because uh, there is two different plantation. So in the other plantation, it's follow the common uh, 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 data that we have only below uh, five years old tree. But in this one estate that have the mud pool, that have the salt lead, that have the place that they like, the trend of damage is different, although the estate is uh, situated next to each other, although the plantation situated each other. So you can see like here, the damage is more on nine years old, on bigger trees. So, uh, uh, if you see, is is about like almost half of it is actually a bigger trees that been damaged, and a total of uh, four thousand for forty nine percent is half this. So I speculate in my research is because of uh, at some point um, they could uh, in their journey to get there they were disturbed by the patrolling team and they were angry and they tried to damage or show more aggressiveness towards the farm, but. Still, this data need to be studied further for to understand this better. And you can see even seventy two percent is bigger bigger trees. It's like nine to above uh, to up to sixteen years old, which is quite tall trees. And then the mitigation effort. If we are talking about mitigation effort, like uh, for elephant, I think because they are clever like us, so they they don't have any single mitigation that you can actually uh, uh, put at, at one place. So even in the estate, I think most of plantation is common now to do stakeholder consultation. You consult with NGO, you consult with government, you consult with your communities, and get trained, and then. Um, at the end, yes, like uh, Dr. Sumit was mentioned, the effectiveness is when you establishing uh, electric fence. Yes, uh, and then the company try out the electric fence in 2016. And even after uh, uh, establishing that, we still getting uh, information from the other parties like NGO universities to come and evaluate the effectiveness of the uh, uh, our electric fencing, the one that been established in the in the in the plantation. So basically, if you see here, um, there is two kind of like Dr. Smith. One mentioned normally they on the administrator, but in plantation normally they do in perimeter fencing, and another one you do only when you do replanting fencing, like because you understand that elephant only came below five, so it's only at replanted. So you only fencing where it's necessary the elephant gonna come and eat the oil pump or not just eat like disturb or destroy the oil pump. And then if you see the uh, trend after putting the electric fence, it's basically it's reduced about like 90% reduced. So electric fence is effective, but it needs a proper plan and um, heavy maintenance, heavy commitment on the maintenance, yes. And um, another, another thing uh, in overall the, uh, of my research, I just want to show that uh, in, in total of damage 2011, the, the human elephant conflict 2011 to 2018, about uh, 200,000 tree has been damaged. And if uh, this convert to the business loss is about 25 million USD for eight plantation. So it's basically about uh, USD 5.9 million. And then uh, at this moment, uh, the, the company also still still has this uh, conflict and uh, the, they still keep looking for the data and uh, continue analyze and see the trend. But as of now, it's still the same. Below five years is the most favorite oil pump if you don't have any favorite ecology spot in your plantation. So the company also have a growing tree insurance, which is, which is quite surprising that it's not common in other uh, plantation, which is quite expensive, right? And the idea of insurance is not like give you money every time, but the portfolio insurance you pay in advance and then you get compensated after that, right? 
And then if we analyze the insurance that been uh, paid during 2009-2018, it's basically uh, paid about 2 million but it being compensated more than 3.6. So I think uh, having an insurance is quite, is quite a good tool to give uh, or to, to get the uh, um, community or plantation, uh, or not just acceptance, but allowing elephant to uh, be roaming in their space or allowing damage in their plantation so that we can at least get a coexistence. Not a coexistence that we, um, we aim or seeing yet, but a little coexistent. Instead, I can see now, like most of managers before, when they have damage of 4,000 trees, they were really angry and all, but now if they have like 400, they, for them, it's quite okay because they have, before they have worse more than that. So that is uh, creating a tolerance between. So insurance can create tolerance or insurance or compensation can create tolerance to the uh, plantation and communities or smallholders. And then if I, if I can uh, summarize the insurance that been claimed during that year, only 32% was claimed for the elephants because it's very only uh, geographically uh, uh, located. It's not like for whole company uh, problem. So if I can conclude uh, from all the image that you see just now, increasing trend, it, uh, there is an increasing trend of palm oil plantation in Malaysia. I think in Sabah, in, Semenan, uh, in Peninsula Malaysia, that, uh, that is committed to support coexistence. People are more open and um, accept the idea of elephant-friendly plantation. It, this is really different from the year 2009. So I think with the uh, increasing, now this is a good trend. And as a consumer, as an individual, I think we should support sustainable practices of, because it's not about, I remember, it's not about crop, it's about practices. So support, whenever that you can support sustainable practices or choose or prefer sustainable practices rather than boycott. Because boycott, people just going to, clear another new land for you to give a new product for you. And um, be, uh, just, to, uh, uh, just to remind everyone, creating elephant-friendly plantation is really expensive. You will need to have a mitigation. You have to have, you have to have engagement. You have to have training to, create, to change mind of every uh, communities or whoever that lives in that area. And um, this is, we need a mechanism to compensate either in a conversation through government or private or NGO or the business itself. So um, the idea of Dr. Sumis was mentioned about tourism in the plantation is, is good, which is you can generate income or give back. But I think another, uh, what we're facing when uh, some company doing that in Malaysia is basically the safety of uh, the safety and um, the guideline how to observe in the plantation which is which is going but in the in in, in progress and then it's quite it, another third uh, important thing conclusion is vital to understand the HEC locally you cannot say oh it's work in Thailand it's work in uh, in India it's work in Sri Lanka and you wanna inter you cannot just like introduce any HEC with uh, others' data. So you have to collect your data, understand your own problem or conflict before you initiate any mitigation. So any NGO or other government from UK tell you, oh, do this, do this. Actually, you have to understand your conflict. You have to understand what is your conflict. Like I showed earlier, there is two different scenarios on one of the uh, scenario where elephant conform. They only eat below five years. So you, you can just focus on that side. But there also has a scenario that elephant doesn't conform with what you expected. So you have to have a mitigation based on your data, your own data. And at the end, one company at a time. When we support, it takes landscape and beyond to save the species. It takes us as a, as a public as well, as a consumer. All right, with that, thank you, Surya. I, uh, thank you. That, that's it, my presentation. Thank you. Back to you, Surya. Thank you, Aida, very much for very focused research. Because uh, in previous three talks, we were talking about the general problem, but here we talked about the focus problem and the need of understanding the root causes and try to focus the mitigation measures to address the real causes and not to prescribe something which is very general. So thank you, Aida, for that. And with that, we conclude all four talks. And now the floor is open for questions. So if someone has questions, I can see Sabrina raising her, her hand. So I can take her questions. And if there are some more, you can do the same, raise your hand or uh, 
write questions in a chat so that I can relate to the talk. And we are already exceeding our time, so sorry for that. But we can still spend, I guess, 10 more minutes uh, in the discussion. And if you have still more questions, what we can do is like you can just drop them in the chat box and we will find. Sabrina. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, very well. Uh, okay, okay. Okay, good morning to you. It was uh, uh, like a nice listen for us. Uh, it's very good to hear. So I had a question to Dr. Bishnu, sir. Is he there? Sorry, I, I can't hear you. Yes, please. Sabrina, you okay. can go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Please. I do have the question for the um, like a tiger conflict with human. So I wanted to ask if um, is there any study that the physical barrier reduces the conflict rate there in Nepal? Uh, excuse me. Can you <clears throat> repeat again? Okay. So I wanted to know if the physical barrier that yeah. um, reduce the conflict between the human tiger. Is there any study you have go through or? Bisnudai, uh, if I may help you, because we do yeah, like okay. electric fencing uh -huh. and things like that, if they are really helping to mitigate this human elephant conflict that we are facing. So are there any researches going on or already done? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Surya. Uh, in Nepal, uh, there are several studies regarding on the electric fencing and solar fencing, which is more effective for the uh, to mitigate the human elephant conflict. But in the case of tiger, there, there were no study regarding on the uh, construction of the physical barriers. But uh, we have created some physical barriers uh, regarding on the uh, to uh, create the barriers for the wild boar and other uh, deer species, uh, it also creates for the barrier for the tiger as well. So, okay, I I get that because in case of a tiger, they're uh, so much powerful. So it's uh, I don't know um, that electric fencing is enough for them, or they can easily come out through that. That's why I asked for uh, okay, I solar just... and electric fence is not for the tiger, it is for the elephant. Yes, electric yeah. fence is commonly used for the elephant. So, in yeah. case of tiger, mm, I don't know which kind of variable is gonna act more. Yeah, we, we need to do the research. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Thank you. So Dr. Ramesh uh, wanted to add something, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, this is for this uh, uh, question about tiger. I think, see, you, physical barrier, tigers tend to even avoid uh, some obstruction on the way. It's really not a big deal. Uh, but to deal with the tiger conflict, it's more of managing the, the large prey because tigers are not venturing, venturing inside to the human habitation. So I think it's uh, much easier to deal with than other species. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh, for clarifying it more. And now... So I think that's another question from uh, Supun Lahir Prakash. Do you see that? Surya, you are mute. Surya, you are. Yeah, I think in the chat box, yeah. Inoka, yes. Uh, I'm yeah. taking questions from chat box now. So yeah. first with the question from the Eben Goodale. Uh, this is again for uh, Bisnu. Uh, what he wants to know is, do you see, because uh, uh, the number of casualties, human casualties increasing, so he wants to know if uh, after observing all these situations, do you still, are you still getting like conservation support from the people? Uh, th thank you, Ben. Yes, uh, 19 human deaths 
in a three years period is very high. Uh, it has created a difficult situation in conservation in Bordia National Park. So we are trying to convince the local people about the importance of the tiger conservation and tiger ecology. Without the community support, our conservation will not be successful. So we have prepared the park level human wildlife conflict mitigation and management strategy by involving all uh, stakeholder and community as well. A community can tolerate the livestock damage, but they cannot tolerate the human casualty. So it is very difficult situation in Bardia. So we are trying to convince them. Thank you, Surya. Surya, you are mute. Sorry. Uh, now I'm going to take another question from Supoon. What he wants to know, and this is a question for all four panelists. What he wants to know is like, is uh, if the political interferences in your countries is affecting conflict mitigations? Am I audible to the panelists? Yes, sir. Yeah, but do you want to, yeah. Anybody want to go? You, you, you don't you just maybe one by one or you want me to go? Or, yeah, I mean, like uh, Dr. Sumit, if you want to say something on it. Uh, yes, in Sri Lanka, that is the biggest obstacle to uh, addressing the human elephant conflict in a scientific way. Uh, as my, even in my presentation, we said there is a conceptual problem of the model that is being used in Sri Lanka for addressing the problem. And for the last for about 15 to 20 years, the scientists who are working on this have realized that there's a conceptual problem with the model and the model needs to be changed. But we cannot get the politicians to agree to that because they still want to continue doing the tried, tested and failed thing, hoping it will work. So the biggest challenge in Sri Lanka to mitigate the human elephant conflict has been political interference. Thank you, Dr. Sumit and Dr. Ramesh, if you want to add something on top of that. No, I, I think I can add in terms of, uh, depends on what you actually see as interference because uh, sometimes this political interference for uh, large development could also be a conflict. So of course, uh, uh, when it comes to human death, then the political interference uh, will come. And I think a lot of efforts now being done in India, uh, I think which is directly helping human wildlife conflict, uh, talking about some insurance scheme by the prime minister office. Uh, I think uh, we just needed to tie it together, but otherwise there is a, I would say a political inference from a positive side, except in the, the development areas where this can be a conflict too. Thank you for pointing out another aspect of the interference. And Aida, if you want to add something on top of Yeah, um, really, Ramesh, I think um, if we're talking human wildlife conflict, of course, if in their political interference, it will be on human side, but I think um, not in particular political figure interference, but the governmental, the, the governance of Malaysia, I think very supportive on uh, species conservation in Malaysia. It's very uh, support and working on, but at the moment, like the target in Malaysia is a uh, tiger and the tiger is very uh, decreasing and critical in Malaysia. So I think not in a political figure itself, but the governance, yes. There is and very supportive. Yeah. And at the end, Bisnu, if you want to add something to it. Like in other countries, yeah, political interference very high in case of uh, human casualty. Yeah. Uh, and because, that is uh, like helping. Sorry? Uh, that is helping to like fix this uh, situation or that's actually worsening the situation? Uh, that uh, become worsening in the situation. So we try to convince them about the conservation. It takes 
many time or many years to convince them. Yeah. Surya, if you don't mind, I have a question for Dr. Ramesh. Uh, will that be okay? Surya, please, you Inuka, yeah. yeah, please, Inuka, go ahead. Yeah, Ramesh, you mentioned during your speech that uh, it's kind of very difficult to convince people right now because of the situation. But can you pull out any sort of example or any measure that you are adopting to reverse this situation, to get more people involved, or at least change their attitude, change their behavior? Uh, towards betterment. Yeah, you know, the, the issue is that uh, people uh, change. I mean, when you try to convince them, the change happens, but it's short-lived because most of this conflict uh, strategies are uh, localized. So unless we do have a kind of a larger policy framework like land use policy, I think land use policy is something that needed to really come in the way. Uh, only then I think it will remain in the mind. Otherwise, when the incident happens, yes, people go and engage and people change. There are, of course, uh, there are many cases uh, the changes have come by. But I was trying to propose that it needed to be a little more integrated so that it, it's both uh, at the top level as well as the bottom level. So it's, it's a big behavioral issue. Like people are involved, live, living in this uh, proximity to the human areas. Unless we try to provide some concrete alternatives to the livelihood, this behavioral adaptation by the human will be short-lived. So we need to look at both at the land use policy level as well as the alternative livelihood. Uh, which can minimize this interface uh, interactions. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. And Ida, you wanted to say something. If not, we will take last one last question. And then others, if you have questions, please just drop it in a chat and we will find a way to get back to you. No, oh, I didn't have agreed with Dr. Ramesh. If no questions from the audience, then I have a question for Bisnu, because in the beginning you said uh, we uh, Nepal as a country is going to meet its uh, target of doubling the tiger, but with this increasing conflict situation, you still think that uh, it will not have any consequences in meeting that target or maintaining the current number of tigers in Nepal. Uh, thank you, Surya. Yeah, I have already told you that uh, Nepal will be the first country to double the uh, tiger by 2022. After that, I think it will be better to maintain the tiger, not uh, increase the number of tigers. If if you want to increase the number of tigers, then we have to uh, increase our area for, for the tiger habitat. Uh, I think it is not uh, easy to extend the area for the tiger habitat because all the surrounding uh, parts of the uh, national park are basically many settlement area are very close to the national park. So it is very difficult to extending the area. So I think it is better to maintain the tiger number only, not more than that. Okay, thank you very much. Enoka, if you want to add something at the end, if not, uh, I propose to wrap up this session here. Thank you, Surya. First, thank you very much uh, for hosting this session. And I would like to thank all the speakers for taking their valuable time. Because at the end of the day, uh, the problem is common, whether it's elephant or whether it's tiger or leopard, there's a problem. Animals get affected, people get affected. And unless we find a solution that strikes a balance, this is going to continue. It's really good that people share their experience and work together to find a solution. So I'm grateful to everybody who uh, sort of spoke today and also to everybody who participated uh, to make this ATPC AP event successful. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Enoka, very much. And I would also like to extend my sincere thanks to all the speakers and all the participants. And indeed that's true, population is increasing. And with that, this human elephant conflict, our uh, human wildlife conflict is bound to uh, increase. And we need to find, yeah, very specific solutions depending on the cases. And we are really glad to hear from all these experienced people, uh, how they are dealing with this 
uh, common problem. Uh, it's not only the problem in the Asia Pacific region, but it's a global problem. So today we had a nice talk about that and that, uh, so we had a common forum to share our ideas and uh, hopefully we will all be benefited from today's sharing. That's what I believe. So thank you everyone for your active participation. And I hope uh, some of you will join us also through the annual meeting. So thank you very much. A big round of applause to everyone. So we will be concluding this session now and another few minutes uh, like five minutes time we'll be starting our agm the business meeting uh, anybody who wishes to participate you are most welcome thank you Good morning to some of you and good afternoon to some of you. Bosco, are we in a position to start? I think you're muted. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Right. Thank you very much and uh, welcome to the, uh, the business meeting or our yeah business meeting as it is. I would like to welcome uh, the, the chapter members as well as uh, all who are attending here today. So the idea is actually to review what we have done and make future plans. So last, uh, last few years have been very challenging, two years have been very challenging to us. I think most of us met in 2019 Sri Lanka meeting. And then since then we didn't have an opportunity to actually meet physically. ATBC meetings have always been very exciting and especially uh, talking about the Asia Pacific meeting, been a very exciting opportunity to gather, share knowledge. But unfortunately we couldn't uh, do that physically over the last two years because of the situation. But somehow the members managed to keep uh, ATBC AP alive through various activities. So today we are going to go through what we have done and also make some future plans, hoping that the situation will improve. So thank you again, everybody, uh, uh, for being here. To start, I would like to invite uh, our uh, chair, uh, Dr. Bosco Chan, to review the activities of 2020 and 2021. Over to you, Bosco. Thank you, Inoka. Uh, hello, everybody uh, attending. Uh, I think good morning for most uh, here, uh, if you are physically in Asia Pacific. Otherwise, good day. Uh, we, as Inoki said, we are having a very challenging time. Uh, I, I think it's the most difficult time in many of our lives. So uh, let's see what we have done uh, in these two years. First of all, I would like to show you uh, the board member list of the current AP chapter that will be standing until uh, 2022. Uh, so uh, Inoka is our secretary and uh, our treasurer is Lindsay. And I must make a very special thank for these two super women that has done most of the work for uh, the AP chapter. Uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, we also have seven country reps. Uh, one is a region, uh, which is Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. So as you can see, we have representative from East Asia, we have representative from South Asia, and we also have a representative from Southeast Asia, all the way to Papua New Guinea. So, it is not bad, although uh, we can have a lot more uh, active participation from many other uh, 
mega biodiverse countries in our region. When Inoka and Lindsay and myself uh, stepped in as uh, the uh, board member team, we made some very exciting plan. So uh, obviously the first thing is to continue to organize our beloved AP annual meeting, uh, which is uh, very exciting and inspiring uh, since it started. Uh, Inokia also came up with a very uh, exciting new idea, which is to establish a AP chapter in country field station somewhere. And it has been suggested it, uh, to be in Sri Lanka. Uh, Inoka already has a perfect spot for that. Uh, and also for uh, Lindsay to mention about uh, Western Sabah uh, for coastal ecology. And we were hoping uh, it could become a regional base for ATBC activities, especially for training uh, field skills for young scientists. We also hope we could have greater participation for more AP countries. Uh, as said, uh, we have many mega hotspot countries uh, here. We have Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, the Indochina countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, and Myanmar, etc. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the lack of physical interaction, I think, uh, really hampered our effort in doing this. We also hope, uh, again, uh, the same issue with uh, increasing our membership. And we also uh, were discussing about identifying critical regional conservation issues and to engage uh, expert members for collaborative research and solutions. Uh, hopefully to jointly publish uh, some of our ideas and thoughts under the ATBC umbrella. But then the pandemic came. Uh, I don't need to elaborate on that. I think uh, we have uh, some of the hardest hit uh, countries in our region and the whole world came to a standstill. Uh, this is our government's uh, efforts uh, asking everybody to stay home. And as I heard, uh, many countries are still uh, implementing that. So I think many of us uh, have to uh, adapt to a new way of life, both personally as well as career-wise. And uh, I would say uh, many of us must have struggled or are still struggling to dive suddenly into this almost 100% virtual world of communication. Uh, as ecologists, I think I've heard many of us has uh, resort to trying to find kind of inner balance, mental balance by doing a lot of field work. Like this is me in Hong Kong. I've been uh, staying in Hong Kong since early 2020. Uh, and I have spent a lot of time in the countryside. Uh, my work uh, mainly were in uh, mainland China and uh, lately, uh, uh, Cambodia. And so I have almost kind of neglected or forgotten how uh, the, the, the natural world of Hong Kong is. But uh, in this uh, last two years, I have again picked up uh, snorkeling uh, in two decades, uh, looking at uh, the not so amazing coral reefs of Hong Kong. And I have seriously do bird watching for Hong Kong uh, the very first time in, in my whole life, and uh, which is very exciting. I have uh, logged 213 egg species in Hong Kong already in uh, 2021. So this actually helps me to uh, kind of get some more understanding of the natural world, which may help my research as well as conservation efforts. But again, ecologists are very hardworking uh, just because we knew we have more free time, not being able to uh, uh, go on field work or, or, or travel. I think many of us have worked extra hard, even harder than uh, the normal years 
to uh, do some research. Like for myself, I have uh, author or co-author 16 papers uh, in one year alone. So uh, that makes me very, very busy because then you have to meet deadlines on submission, on revision and proofreading, etc. And because of that, I think uh, even within the AP board members, we are not any less busy than before. So I would say we have done kind of like limited uh, activities uh, in 2020 and 2021. Uh, Inoka and, and Lindsay and uh, myself has uh, been, uh, have been uh, actively participating in the ATPC global online meetings. But I must confess that uh, due to a lot of this, uh, my real job commitments, I have uh, missed quite a number of them also. And we also held uh, a number of ATBC AEP board meetings in 2019, 2020, as well as uh, uh, lately. And we have maintained online communications among uh, the uh, members, uh, board members, uh, via emails and a social media uh, instant messaging device. And because of that, we are having this wonderful uh, side event uh, today. Uh, again, I, I, I want to highlight, uh, especially Lindsay's spe spearheading this whole event and uh, uh, making it happen, which is uh, proven to be quite popular. Uh, the latest I read is we have 137 registered participants, so uh, which is great. Uh, but more importantly, uh, Ramesh, our Indian representative, has been a superstar in pulling the annual meeting off during this very difficult time, especially when we consider India is one of the hardest hit uh, countries in the world uh, with uh, the pandemic. But uh, we are going to have a Conservation Asia 2022 in March in South India as a joint meeting with the Society for Conservation Biology Asia section. And we are going to hear more about it uh, from Ramesh uh, later on. And again, uh, Lindsay, our uh, superhero, ha has uh, helped organize two online workshops uh, to train early career AP members on uh, statistics as well as GIS during uh, this period. And that is about it for our work. So for the future plan for AP chapter, I basically just copy and paste what we originally planned to do because uh, we have done a very limited number of uh, our targets. We have met uh, a very limited uh, amount of our target. So to organize uh, any meeting as usual is uh, ongoing and uh, it will involve again your support or of your support in the organization as well as participation. And when the COVID finally decided to go away, I think it will be very, very exciting for the AP chapter to really uh, 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 organize ourselves and try to look for one or even two sites with a very different ecosystem or, uh, or biogeography to establish field stations uh, for our future research and collaboration. Uh, as well as by uh, inviting more uh, participation for more AP countries and uh, enlarging our membership. Uh, uh, this is about it. And if we can achieve this plan, I think uh, the, the board of this current board uh, will have been uh, doing some excellent job. Uh, I think everybody missed the physical uh, meeting. It is uh, a very excellent 
way of uh, mingling and sharing ideas and socializing. Uh, these are pictures, my fond memories of uh, the ATBC Kuchin 2018. So let's hope we can meet in person very soon, hopefully in India in half a year's time. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bosco. Thanks a lot. It was challenging, but uh, we managed to keep the chapter alive. And now we need the strength and the support of uh, everybody to keep it going and perhaps uh, learn from the lessons. Uh, I mean, there were a lot to learn from. Anyway, the next agenda item is about the 2019 meeting we had in Sri Lanka. So uh, as the country representative at that time, uh, at, at, at the country representative at that time, it was challenging for us too, because we were in a sort of a critical political situation at that time. We always came to the point of not having the meeting, but then thanks to uh, the ATBC, the support from ATBC Global and the Asia Pacific chapter, and I borrow the term from uh, Bosco, the superhero team we had in Sri Lanka. Now, when I turn back and think about it, it's a small group, how we managed to pull that through, to that excellence is sort of amazing. So I hand it over to Dr. Sampal Sanviratna, who's the country representative of Sri Lanka, to present our case, to remind what we did and uh, present our, that memorable event. Yes, over to you, Sampal. Thank you, Inoka. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, audible, right? Okay. Guys? Yes, you are. Yes, uh, you you are. Guys in here. All right, great. I will, uh, thanks. Uh, yes, Inoka, thank you. and. Uh, yeah, I will uh, give you guys a, a short uh, uh, kind of a kind of a brief, uh, more of a nostalgic uh, statement <laughs> of the the past. Uh, I think uh, the last meeting of uh, you know physical meeting of uh, AP. Uh, so I will share the screen, and I will start our story. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, you know, I mentioned. Uh, uh, I I could remember. Uh, I we forgot to uh, really mention. Uh, this particular bit uh, during the, the AP conference, partly because we were too busy in terms of uh, organizing everything and all, uh, that uh, in uh, Jan we we got the the the, the baton at uh, Kuchin in uh, I think in uh, July, right? July uh, 2018. Uh, Inoka, myself, Professor Gunatilakas, and uh, several of the the key players at the 2019 meeting were there. And then uh, by 2018 December, uh, we were all set. We had the website uh, launched. We had uh, several meetings. We had several donors in place. So we were right on track. And we called for uh, sign, uh, like you know, abstracts. And uh, the deadline for abstract submissions were on April uh, 2019, end of April. And by, uh, but uh, in middle, mid April, there was a huge terrorist attack in Sri Lanka, uh, pro the, the, the largest after the war, uh, targeting uh, the economic uh, centers uh, of country 13, uh, like actually like uh, synchronized attacks and the entire country was standstill. So, so we couldn't uh, like, so that lasted till May, end of May 2019, uh, to kind of a give, get the clearance uh, to do anything, not just an uh, international conference, but, uh, but to do any social activity from the country. So we were waiting for the, the U UN uh, and uh, European Union's uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just... I'm just not showing you the slides. This is a story that we forgot to tell you during 2019, I believe. And so, in the end of May, the United, uh, the European Union uh, actually uh, issued a report about the safety of Sri Lanka, and it kind of gave us the clearance to do that. And uh, we had the constant support from the ATPC Global, and uh, eventually in uh, mid June. Uh, just barely two and a half months before the, yeah, about two, 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 two and a half months before the conference, we got the green light to go ahead. And so the plan for five months of work being done in two months time, but we pulled it off. 
with some uh, lapses in terms of small small organizations so we moved the venue to uh, off colombo location for safety we brought the president in <laughs> so so we got the full state funded uh, protection for all the members uh, of the participants and so on so it, we managed to pull something uh, fairly extraordinary and uh, there were some discussions of uh, uh, postponing it to 2020 <laughs> and luckily we didn't because the uh, pandemic came uh, if we postpone it it would never happen anyway with that note i will uh, share my screen uh, this is a small nostalgic statement about uh, the uh, the 2019 uh, uh, ap chapter meeting we called it asia pacific conference uh, you guys can see my screen okay yes surya thanks thanks surya okay so uh, so to attract uh, donors and uh, attract uh, the the well wishers and also the interest parties of uh, uh, atbc especially in sri lanka because uh, atbc is uh, even though it's a, it's a global tropical body you know sri, uh, it is uh, it is, uh, we wanted to really give uh, it, a, it a grounding in Sri Lanka, especially in the, in the universities and uh, other stakeholder community. So we make it a conference and uh, uh, the, uh, we done it in September, uh, first two weeks of September, 2019. Uh, we make the theme, the safe study use uh, to kind of really uh, go slightly beyond uh, a conventional conference and we invited uh, uh, true stakeholders, the business parties, uh, the, uh, the, the government agencies like forest department, wildlife department, coast conservation department, like government agencies into the conference. Also, we brought uh, the, uh, the, uh, the key business parties in Sri Lanka, especially the environmentally sensitive businesses like plantation sector, industry, uh, even garment sector, uh, you know, the apparel sector and so on uh, through a uh, 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 business and biodiversity platform, which we call Biodiversity Sri Lanka, the key a partnership with them. And uh, so the, the idea was to have the save study use concept live in the conference. Uh, with that, uh, the conference had uh, four days of actual conference. Uh, with uh, seven uh, plenary speakers and plenary speakers also uh, uh, range from uh, highly academic, uh, kind of top-notch um, authorities in the field of conservation biology to uh, some of the leaders in sustainable uh, industry. Uh, and uh, I thought one of the key highlights of the, of the conference was this, this, uh, uh, this, those talks. And we had the 32 technical symposia, parallel sessions, uh, 224 scientific and public talks. We had uh, four evening public events uh, parallel to the conference in, in the conference venue, uh, speed talks, and uh, about 400 uh, participants, uh, and uh, uh, pre-conference workshops. Uh, those who participated knew that there was strict, very strict uh, uh, security because, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the scale uh, of uh, uh, that, uh, the, that uh, events of uh, that unrest uh, was quite, quite, uh, quite uh, there even when we were uh, having the conference and uh, that conference was the first uh, such large conference happened uh, after April after the terrorist attack uh, uh, that uh, you know uh, in Sri Lanka. So so the so this uh, within this uh, really dark period, the silver lining was including the president of the of the of the country and most of the state agencies and public private sector wanted us to do the conference because as a as a as a kind of a to lift the uh, uh, the the, the the situation the the doldrums the country had so so even though it was very bad times we were doing well at the end uh, especially in the last month because we got the full state and uh, the private pr pr private sector support to do all these events including the security and safety uh, so inoka uh, led the led the team uh, i was uh, there 
because Inoka located uh, in uh, uh, about uh, 100 kilometers away from the capital. So I, uh, the few people from University of Colombo, we were the kind of the Colombo hub, and then Inoka and we constantly work and uh, uh, Nalaka and few others, Professor Gunatilakas, they were in another city. So uh, traveling and transportation was also a bit of an issue at one point, but we managed to uh, have this uh, coordination. Uh, mostly this is the, the organizing, local organizing committee consisted of very few people. Uh, it worked well because we had uh, uh, like uh, people like uh, Professor Gunatilakas who are well known to uh, ATBC community as well as uh, uh, you know some uh, kind of people with legal background, the people with uh, diverse backgrounds, including uh, like like Mr. Tilal Nanakar, who is a communication consultant coming from the private sector, and then we had uh, architects, uh, we had uh, former government officers. Uh, uh, helping us and uh, providing the needed support and especially the connections uh, in the in the uh, uh, to navigate through the government ladder bureaucratic ladder which helped a lot at the end uh, especially the, considering the the, the the logistical difficulties we have to navigate through on top of that we had the the ATP, atbc global uh, uh, community uh, constantly especially i should uh, thank uh, lindsay ahimsa and then uh, and then uh, you know the, uh, the 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 AP chapter, and uh, basically we were encouraged, we were supported and assured throughout the time uh, to for us to decide make decisions uh, locally based on the on the on the ground situation, which is really great actually, very comforting. And uh, people like Ruchira Somavira, people like. Uh, uh, Ted Webb, uh, Bosco, and uh, Ahimsa, they, they really work with us uh, uh, to navigate this through. Uh, and then uh, we had, a, had the scientific committee, uh, basically Professor Gunatilak and I uh, led the, the, that side, uh, uh, which, which was challenging uh, because we have to postpone uh, the deadlines uh, about two to two and a half months uh, to accommodate the uncertainties. But uh, the, I think to me, the personally, the greatest uh, uh, kind of uh, thing that we've done in the conference is to go to a very remote uh, uh, venue. Uh, there were some uh, logistical uh, difficulties for some people because uh, it was far away from uh, main cities, but it was a very nice, sustainable green location, almost like a campus, but privately owned. Uh, green uh, 26 acre green uh, sorry 32 acre green uh, space with uh, auditorium uh, uh, accommodation uh, all the facilities needed uh, so it was a nice break and uh, we were able to secure the periphery uh, and uh, provide the much needed uh, uh, safety for everybody during that time and it had uh, cultural events and uh, uh, kind of most of the stuff that we wanted to have in a, in a, in a global uh, international conference. Uh, so we managed to uh, attract the, the president of Sri Lanka. Uh, actually, uh, this is some side note. I think we are proud to uh, mention that it was one of his last uh, uh, official uh, appearances as the, the, uh, the president of Sri Lanka or the leader of the, uh, the state leader of the country. But just before he left his office, he signed a, a kind of a remarkably uh, important and critical document uh, en encompassing a very large uh, tract of uh, partly uh, protected, partially cover protected uh, tropical rainforest into one large uh, kind of a network of tropical rainforest. Uh, uh, and that was the last document he signed before he left the office. That was about um, uh, like you know month after the ATBC conference. So, so I think uh, we made some uh, uh, progress in in a, in a very different bureaucratic uh, room uh, in the in the conference. Uh, we had, as I mentioned, uh, two keynote addresses uh, during the conference. Uh, Dr. Sajal Rora came and uh, gave us a great uh, presentation. Uh, as well as a, a local professor uh, gave us a, a insights on the, the Sri Lankan Cascade uh, Network. 
and then the the plenaries as i mentioned we had the uh, the, the 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 people like professor gunatilakas who who worked on the sri lankan tropical systems for, for almost uh, three decades now and then regional experts like professor webb and uh, Novotny, and then uh, uh, madhu verma came from indian uh, in, uh, Institute of Forest Management, as well as uh, Mr. Dilhan Fernando, one of the key uh, private sector partner players in Sri Lankan uh, green uh, revolution, in a way uh, to make uh, green uh, industries and sustainable uh, public private ventures. Uh, so he gave us a great uh, talk as well. We had uh, pre-conference workshops uh, for 10 days before the conference, uh, and then uh, we had some several side events, uh, which were really great because this is way off uh, from the main grid. So from uh, food to uh, snacks to everything has to be given in, in within the facility. And we had this uh, lunchtime and dinner time events, uh, which I thought uh, went well. Uh, and also we established uh, the Sri Lanka Ecological Association during that time, like many other organizations, the, the uh, SLIA, which we called, uh, also started well, but now uh, in a slow pace because of the pandemic and related issues. Uh, we had uh, early bird, uh, bird walks, uh, yoga, bicycle rides, and uh, field trips. Uh, field trips were not as vibrant as we planned because of the travel restrictions imposed uh, due because of the, the security measures but uh, but we managed to as a as a as a as a group uh, atbc managed to pull off a, a great uh, great event i think uh, very interactive uh, no shopping no traveling around because we were all stuck in this 32 acre island so it was great uh, great uh, times uh, and uh, these are some of the, the, the behind the scene activities, uh, you know, the president planting uh, uh, the sapling and the sapling is about 10 uh, foot tall tree now. Uh, and that is pr probably the last plant that uh, the president planted as the president of Sri Lanka and which is an endemic mango uh, tree, uh, which is still uh, uh, doing well, <laughs> the location. And uh, so we had other events and uh, uh, we had the key part players, the government supported us, uh, Biodiversity Secretariat, Biodiversity Sri Lanka, the business and uh, biodiversity platform that I mentioned earlier, ATBC, several banks and MAs, uh, the key uh, uh, private sector partner that worked with us, uh, our local host was the Field Ontology Group of Sri Lanka, of the University of Colombo, uh, and uh, UNDP supported us uh, with uh, printing uh, and related matters. And uh, yeah, so that's about it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, looking forward for the next meeting uh, in India. Over to you, Inoka. Inoka, you are muted. Yeah, thank you. OK, all good. So good memories and uh, looking forward to something exciting in India. Uh, thanks again for sharing that. Now is the time for the treasurer report. Uh, Bosco, is Lindsay there or is uh, Naomi presenting that? Hi, Naomi? yes. Yes, thank you. The treasurer's yeah. report. Um, so, yes, thank you. I think Bosco is sharing his screen or is that you, Anoka? Uh, well, I, think, uh, I think it must be Ivan, not me. Oh. It's me, yeah. Okay. okay, I'll just say next when I need to go to the next slide. Um, so I believe that this is just, please forgive me, I am not the treasurer. So if I do <laughs> say something that isn't correct, I do sincerely apologize, as does Lindsay, sincerely apologize for not being able to make it here. As you can see from the Bitmoji, I do not have a blonde ponytail, so I am most definitely not Lindsay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the second slide I think is where it starts. Um, yes, so this is the report for the global account from as I understand it. Um, so some money has come out in 2019 to support the Asia Pacific chapter, but nothing else has come out in the last uh, two years or so because of the pandemic. 
So the next slide. Um, so yes, this is the treasurer's report for the Asia Pacific chapter local account, which is held here in Hong Kong. Um, so as I was explained, we got some money coming in from the global ATBC group, and we took out some money to sponsor workshops, which were the activities that Bosco mentioned earlier, the, the training workshops. Um, so that was the only outgoing expense, as far as I understand. And then the next slide is the audited reports or the audited figures from the uh, Asia Pacific chapter meeting in Sri Lanka in 2019, which Anoka and Sampath covered wonderfully, wonderfully just now. Um, from what I understand, there was a small profit of which Part of that is going to be retained and used for ATBC approved activities in Asia Pacific. And then the next slide. <laughs> um, this is the quarterly report for 2021 and essentially no money was spent this year for obvious reasons. <laughs> and then the next slide, which is the final slide. Um, I think this is the consolidated report and what the current financial position is for 2021. As I understand it, the funds are currently being held um, and some of that is going to be diverted to give an advance to the meeting in India and some of it is going to be diverted to support ATBC AP members to travel to the Conservation 2022 event. So yes. I may add, add something to that now, maybe especially with the Sri Lankan accounts with some part the uh, kindly uh, finalized. It took us a time because once again, the difficulties in getting receipts and all these things due to the situation. But finally, we are done and happy to say that uh, we raised enough money to uh, cover all the activities and to pay the, the loans that have been given to us from ATBC uh, Global, we got a loan. And also at the beginning from the Asia Pacific chapter, which was kept as a retainer without being spent actually in the case of emergency. So we are capable of uh, settling all that. And on top of that, we have a little bit of earning that also will be used for activities. So that's, uh, thank you again, Sampath, for doing the accounts. Uh, just to say that we are happy to be done with it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again. Over to you. Naomi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, okay. That was all that, yeah, Lindsay asked me to report on. So as far as I understand it, that's concluded. So the uh, accounts have been circulated among the, the board members for comments. So far, we have not received any objection or any, any questions. So I hope uh, we can take it as it is. Uh, until now, we have received uh, responses from pretty much everybody saying that uh, no objections. Right. That's where we are right now. Thank you. Okay, any questions on that before I move to the next item? Because we are running short of time. I hope uh, this. Any questions? Anything to clarify? Okay. Uh, so, next one is uh, the a little, a bit of briefing on uh, Conservation Asia 2021 joint meeting. There's something I specifically need to mention. Ramesh has been really helpful and instrumental in running the 2019 meeting. He was with us all the time, helping to find speakers, bringing students, find financial support. So has been like a really pillar of strength for our meeting. So with that, now he's taking all that to the 2022 meeting. Ramesh, over to you to brief about your plans for the coming year. Thank you, Enoka, and thank you, everyone. So uh, I think as we all know, it's been a tough time for all of us. So at the outset, I like to Make a mention that you know so we are trying to make this uh, 2022 meeting in fact 2021 it was supposed to be so because of the pandemic we moved to 2022 uh, tentatively we have planned on march so i before getting into this uh, the proposal i like to request all of you participating and also spread the message uh, we need to fight this pandemic out i mean we cannot uh, go on with it so somehow we need to have our safeguards and plan to make this possible next year so I am just basically going to share the the PowerPoint that I have. If somebody can just uh, confirm if it is seen. 
Menaka, is it my screen is visible? Yes, clear. Yes. Okay, cool. Please. So um, I think there's one important uh, uh, point for this uh, uh, next year, uh, the annual meeting, although it is called annual meeting. So it's going to be a joint meeting of uh, Society for Conservation Biology Asia chapter and our uh, Asia Pacific chapter. Therefore, it is now called as a Conservation Asia. It was kind of a similar one that we had in 2016 in uh, Singapore. So we are hoping that you now we will definitely have because this also came uh, as a part of this uh, Sri Lanka meeting dis discussion that we said, since many organizations are working together, maybe why don't we bring a synergy and then uh, uh, have a kind of conference of this nature together so that whatever we come up with, um, it can be uh, very coordinated and it can be very helpful. So um, as of now, I mean, it is uh, basically uh, a proposed, I mean, I would say it's kind of confirmed date uh, uh, ex uh, subject to the confirmation from ATBC board and ACB board, but it is 1922, March uh, 2022 uh, is where the uh, meeting is. So with the uh, three days uh, being the main event with the one day before and after uh, the data for pre-conference uh, discussions and tours. So we have, I mean, this this is going to be happening in a excellent city called Koyamathur, which is on the foothills of the Western Ghats. And it's very well connected to all the regions, um, including Sri Lanka, I think you can just uh, walk over it's not very far. So it's, it's uh, then we have a coastal uh, marine system. And one important thing, there's one, uh, the college called Kumaraguru College of Technology, they have an excellent campus. So they've been uh, very kind enough to offer the venue and provide support. So we expect, I mean, I, I'm actually in the same region right now. I visited the place. I can tell you this is a meeting for this uh, World Convention. And the ideal, even with uh, COVID, there could be enough safeguards uh, no, no, uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, what do you say um, social distancing other uh, protection that we need so this is a meeting which will be hosted by um, the kumara group college of technology and uh, co-hosted by wildlife Institute of india where i work there's also institute called salimali center for uh, conservation and uh, natural history which is also the ministry's uh, institution in addition we have the wildlife trust of india the that's a local organization there's a government college so these are core team and uh, they will be a part of this. And uh, now uh, we have, I mean, as per the protocol of uh, the, both organizations, so this meeting will be uh, kind of um, supported through different committees. So one is a steering committee, which is uh, generally uh, represented by ATBC um, Global, SCB Global, and some of these partner organizations. And uh, between me and one of the representatives from Conservation Asia will be co-chairing and trying to provide uh, whatever the support system. So I think uh, here we would uh, definitely be requesting a nomination from ATP, CAP, and SCB. So this is a general steering committee, which is represented by both organizations and widely represented. Then we have this typical local organizing committee, which what uh, Sambath was explaining for the Stenga. It will be done by the local team. We already have the names of the people who have been part of it, and which basically means that we are well set uh, in terms of who's doing what except there's one addition here uh, based on the recent meeting, you know, and um, I think Bosco for uh, your uh, suggestion. And uh, so we basically we will now try to have a local steering committee, uh, which is to support the local organizing committee, uh, which is of internal where we have a local leaders who can bring resources and support. So we thought that that could be one value addition. So this will be adding it in the proposal, may not be adding in the proposal, but we'll take it a call of a local organizing committee. Then we have a scientific committee, which again be uh, represented by all of you. Uh, so, which is looking at both the programs and things like that. Then we have a general advisory committee, which is uh, mostly comprised of heads of the organization. So, basically, structure of the um, the conference is kind of uh, worked out. And uh, so, it's uh, going to be a hybrid event. I mean, definitely, uh, we're hoping that 30 to 70 pass, uh, participants minimum, if the worst case scenario, in the best case scenario, we can have 70, 30 uh, participants, 70 in person and 30 uh, virtual. And uh, I think this institution is capable to support all the technological problem because they have been conducting international meetings quite well. So I'm not going to read through uh, all this uh, details of the organization, um, but I can just quickly go into specific detail. Maybe I can uh, answer. So overall, uh, the branding of this will be like Conservation Asia. I insisted on since it is a joint meeting. So both the organization, ATBC, SCB, uh, will be reflected equally, uh, you know, widely to reflect as a real joint meeting. 
So we have, uh, I mean, currently this proposal has been submitted to uh, uh, both the organizations. We're just waiting for this to be vetted and endorsed. Uh, with this, then we will have a MOU, which will be signed by the local host, the Kumaragur Institute and the ATBCAP and uh, SCB Asia, although both uh, global boards will have endorsement, okay? So in fact, uh, we have uh, other uh, members, all those specific details are there. This is uh, located, as I said, at the foothills of the Western Guards. And uh, it's an, you know, the campus area is 150 acre. It's a huge campus with the different blocks and the different uh, venues, posters, anything you name it, it's available. Uh, it's very accessible. You can see this uh, photograph. It's, it's like a palatial place. And it's, it's slightly older, I would say, this picture. And uh, we have much more greenery now. And uh, we have a lot of support system. In fact, the time that we'll be having this meeting, they are all going to be having this founder, founder day celebration, which means that the additional support, decoration, everything will be coming to us free of cost. So, uh, and we have this uh, huge meeting for uh, opening ceremony and validatory function. It can accommodate um, 1,200 people. So I don't think I was physically there. It's an excellent ambience and the air condition with the audiovisual system. And uh, this is the other uh, stages that we have. And these are some of the keynote uh, meeting where we can have 150 people. So we have facilities for different options. There's the inaugural keynotes and sometimes session keynotes and dedicated session. And these are some of the classrooms which will have a uh, parallel sessions. And there's workshops and uh, discussions we have. So in fact, the structure of the conference we had decided into in terms of, uh, of course, we will have uh, support from the, the scientific committee. So we're thinking of uh, having a session of three hours each day, starting with the keynote and presentation and then panel so that it combines the same theme so that we can conclude nicely. That's the format currently we're thinking. Then we will have a co-chair, two co-chairs. One will be the co-chair, which is represented by the organization. One co-chair will be a local leader so that now they can also bring uh, support and we love coordinators volunteers all of them so accommodation is available and uh, i think it will be subsidized for people for coming from outside uh, there are many international level hotels uh, i don't think uh, it's going to be a problem uh, so we can uh, have uh, all the access the nearest airport is uh, the Coimbatore international airport just to 10 kilometer away and we have a railway station which is 11 kilometer away there's a bus station uh, it's in many places uh, all around so the travel, uh, I think uh, it, it, it's uh, not going to be very expensive because uh, accommodation will be cheaper as compared to other uh, international events. So we have lined up excellent uh, pre and post conference opportunities, field trips, independent uh, no tourism opportunities, one day tours, outside city, three to seven days tours. I think this area is surrounded by some excellent national parks, wildlife sanctuaries with elephants, tigers, and, and, and nilgritas, endemic species. I think uh, the Time is also permissible for us to travel to coastal region, central India, northern India, if people want. So we are just hoping that pandemic doesn't bother us anymore and we can make it to work. So with this uh, proposal now and endorsement by all of you, then with the MOU sign, I think we are hoping to make a formal announcement with web website and uh, next month. We already screened a couple of uh, students who could be a coordinator. So I think uh, all these are now already worked out. And uh, we are also hoping some of these international agencies to participate. Our whole expectation is to have something like 700 people. So currently 325 in person, 345. But in addition, we'll have some local events involving uh, local communities and uh, uh, some of the actions uh, that, that are relevant to the part of the region. So as you see here, it's uh, the main event already is set. So the program is uh, structured this way. Um, so we have opening uh, remarks and uh, banker culture program. I think uh, it's more or less we are ready, except that uh, once we have this MOU signed, then we will have a detailed program, and then we can go on. So I'm, I might be sounding extremely positive, but, but uh, as if nothing is happening in the, around the world. But <laughs> but the, the situation is uh, tough. Even Kaimutur is also facing a pandemic. But the, my point is that many of us are getting vaccinated. I think this is a one request call to all of you who are participating and also going to be participating, get yourself vaccinated as much as, as soon as possible. So that with all of us being vaccinated, I think the conservation community is the one which should be showing the way to the world as to how you can continue to run the business as usual with the proper safeguard and things like that. Because if we continue to shy away, the situation is not going to improve. 
I think we are hoping that this particular meeting will also be one of the showcase model as to how to kind of try and run the in principle I mean, in person meeting uh, with proper safeguard and all the educated people behaving responsibly managing the event. So we which basically means that we need everyone's support, not just to presenting and to you know, participate in a manner that will reflect the, the you know, global concern. So I think that's all I have uh, to say. And uh, just final word is that we were requesting all the board members and uh, this country representative to ensure you physically participate and you also at least find few people who can come. So with all the situation we have, even though we are meant to prepare, if we need to push it for further, we'll push it with the strategy of strengthening, but Conservation Asia will happen and shall happen in 2022 with all your support. Thank you. Thank you, Inoka, and uh, thank you, all the board members. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you for all that uh, faith and excitement and motivation. Yes, we will do it. We'll find a way. Thanks again. Thank you. Yes. So with that, I'm opening the floor for discussions because uh, ATBC has been successful in keeping the conservation community together for a long time. There are so many expectations, so many objectives of popularizing science, assisting young scientists, sharing knowledge, applications, implementation. With our annual meeting, the greatest happening. But nevertheless, we have so many other things happening right around the world. So it's time uh, for us to come up with more suggestions. A hybrid scenario, assuming that this will continue, this uh, physical restrictions continue, what are we going to do? If not, if we can come out of this, what are the things, exciting, interesting things that we can plan? It's time for people to step in and come up with novel ideas, perhaps address the needs in their own countries, and perhaps find ways how ATPC can join and help so I'm opening this floor for discussions uh, for some new ideas. And with that, we are also going to address the country representatives. Please make sure that uh, you spread the word about ATBC and ATBC Asia Pacific chapter. Get more people involved. We really need uh, the membership drive to continue. Recruit people, uh, build network, communicate with the scientists and make use of this wonderful platform for the implementation of uh, science. With that, it's open for discussion. Please come up with certain things that you think that you would like to see happening in your country or in your institute or overall. Shall we start with Bosco since you are our leader? Of this, the, the things that you suggested, uh, how do you plan to go ahead? Well, uh, Ramesh uh, is uh, quite raring to go. I, I think it really depends on uh, the situation. But uh, in terms of uh, the organization, uh, Eben, who is now based in Guangxi, Again, just contacted me, you know, offering his and his uh, wife Uromi's uh, support in participating in the organization. So we have at least two ATPC members that are very willing to, to contribute to the organization. Though. But uh, I think it's better if we, uh, first of all, is uh, Ramesh already sent us the proposal. I think wait until this virtual meeting is finished and then we give uh, Lucia and whoever a little bit of a break and then we will uh, kind of like uh, hurry them up to give us a, a feedback. Once this is confirmed and endorsed, uh, it's time for, for the board to have another uh, online meeting, I guess. Unfortunately, online meeting to, to discuss about all this. Yeah, to add to that, actually, I was just talking to uh, Eben and Jerome a little while ago. They highlight the importance of having hybrid meetings even in future, because there are times we have to understand sometimes for students, it's hard to travel. Physical meetings are fantastic, but sometimes travel money is limited. So in that case, 
having a small hybrid component, sort of a virtual component in every meeting is sort of something encouraging. That's what he mentioned, to which I agree, because still gives an opportunity to participate, even if you don't have financial sort of uh, support to travel. This is the one, one thing. The other thing they mentioned is that uh, they are willing to help Ramesh with the scientific work. Ramesh, for the scientific committee, I think uh, you'll benefit a lot by having uh, Dr. Eben, Professor Eben and Professor Yuromi. They helped us a lot with the Sri Lankan meeting as well. And uh, they're well experienced and uh, can be very, very sort of an asset to your team. So they kindly offered to help. So that's the message sure. that I want to deliver. Yeah, it's brilliant. I think, uh, you know, and Bosco, I think the idea is that we have the local organized committee as a separate team. So I think last time when we had this opportunity, uh, I think Yunaka was also very open. So we tried to get as many uh, people as, uh, on board. I think there's a lot and more to actually organize. Since it is a joint meeting with the multiple events, I think all the helps will be uh, very much welcome. I think uh, we are open. We should, after the proposal endorse, then when we have a separate meeting also, because uh, the constitution of scientific committee will also take place. Now, there are works to be done for the in-person activity. There's a, a virtual, there's a poster. I think there's a multitude of activities that we are thinking of. Um, so yes, for by all means, I'm not just uh, them and anybody else who are willing to participate, please uh, let's get it and uh, we will see. And as for the, the field station that we suggested, I think I have Sampath uh, with me on my side on that too. And then Lindsay was thinking of uh, uh, Borneo. We will work on that. We need to discuss with Lucia and Patricia and honor how to go ahead. But no, uh, this, I have another point for this also. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, Yunaka. I Sorry. think uh, given uh, Asia Pacific and the tropical concern, I think uh, we would also like to have one in India. Okay. I think uh, <laughs> we, we can have it. Because the reason is uh, the, the learning opportunity for people. I mean, you need to always see uh, what when you're running a course, it's possible to have in multiple places. And uh, because people can afford, cannot afford given the situation. Maybe there are Indian participants wants to come, but some could be connected virtually, some could go. So this idea of having this in Sri Lanka, Borneo, or even uh, Hong Kong, whatever, I think it's a good idea to have a network of the field station. Um, we should uh, probably explore this option. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else from the, the participants who are here today? Any other comments? We yeah, also need to please. highlight. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm Dr. Sabrina Fidus from Bangladesh. Okay. So I would like to know if you do have a representative for, for the uh, from here, like from Bangladesh. So it will be easier for us to communicate with or to join the annual meetings or conferences. That's fantastic. Bosco, can we have your slide on the, 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 the board, the team? Can you share your slide? Yes. Uh, oh. This is actually my phone. I, I don't have it here, I'm sorry. But um, how can I oh, do oh, it? I can okay. screen. Because uh, it was going to be the next agenda item. I think what you brought out uh, is really Sabrina, uh, like a uh, valid point. Because we only have limited number of countries with representatives. Yeah. And we were going to suggest, mm. ask people to come forward uh, for the mm. other countries to have representatives. So definitely, would you like to, uh, we'll, we'll come to that point, Sabrina, definitely. Oh, this is the slide, yes. So for China, we have Hong Kong, India, Malaysia, Nepal, Papua New Guinea, and Sri Lanka, but not for Bangladesh. Yes. So yeah. we will come to that point then. And uh, the other representatives as well, anyone else? who want to suggest more country representatives, that will be the next agenda item. So thank you. Yep. Any other question? We need from Bhutan as well. We, I think Sorry? we should, uh, I think we need to reach out to different countries, known contact to have represented from Bhutan. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think um, so whatever the possible countries that uh, we have missed out. Australia, we I, don't have anyone. No. Is it Pacific? Yeah. I think we should. Probably we should. I think for the. I was hoping that for the next conservation is a meeting, uh, we should have as many as uh, country participate as possible. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, even if you can't think of anything uh, novel, any suggestions, please feel free to email us. 
because we are looking forward to uh, putting together all your ideas, especially Bosco, when we are developing the plan for the coming years. Uh, when we are developing the plans for the coming years, we are looking forward to putting together all your ideas and making the implementation plan. So please feel free to write to us, email us, me or Bosco, Lindsay, or any member who can communicate and uh, go ahead with that. With that, since uh, we are sort of running short of time, we only have maybe 20 minutes past our time, actually. Uh, election of officers, Bosco, I think uh, the current board is valid until 2022, the mm -hmm. officers, right? Then uh, the country representatives. But as uh, Sabrina suggested, we need uh, more people for the countries that are not represented. So, can we nominate someone for Bangladesh on the spot? Sabrina, are you willing to step forward? Yeah. As a representative? Uh, it's, it's me, you're talking about me? <laughs> you're the one who suggested, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm asking whether you are willing to be the country representative or do you have anyone yeah, else? Of course, why not? Because uh, I, I don't know actually uh, if there is any member for this chapter because I was already member for 2019 and um, I have also attended conferences of a chapter in 2016. Uh, you I, could, I actually you don't know if, if there are other members who are willing so to since you are attending up. and you could be Sabrina, what do you do? Can you just give us a brief uh, sort of intro about you? Just a couple of sentences. What do you do right now? Yes, yes of course. Uh, I'm Dr. Sabrina Fiddus. I'm from Bangladesh and I have completed my graduation from Tijong Veterinary and Animal Sciences University. Um, uh, and now uh, currently I'm in a uh, university and as a lecturer in medicine. Okay. Uh, can someone propose? Can someone propose Sabrina in this case? And some, someone second it. I propose. Right. Thank you, Bosco. I can second it. I second right. it. Yeah. Good. You are in, Sabrina. Congratulations. Wow. And it's, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so it's much. It's your turn now to get Bangladesh in, encourage young people to participate, and I'm yes, really good. interested in what you are doing. Right. Uh, it's good to have some medical practitioner uh, in this sector. There's so much you can do. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. It's really Elliot, neat for us. Sorry? It's really neat for us and, and the students. Um, uh -huh. Nowadays, I'm just dealing with the students. Uh, I'm in this profession, like in teaching profession, I'm being uh, almost one and a half year. So there are so many students who are interested in this uh, conservation line. So I want to encourage them to do that and go for So next meeting, you can just take the bus and come. You don't need to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Please send us a short bio like of you. We need to send it yeah, to the web course. page. Please do. And we, like Ramesh said, we need Bhutan, we need Australia, and we there are other mm -hmm. countries. If you, you have uh, colleagues, please uh, work on this. We can continue to sort of recruit as we go. In Noka, maybe I think there is someone. Sorry, 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 sorry. sorry. One, just one, one, one point. Now, what I was hoping is, uh, Inoka, between uh, all of us, uh, country rep, we each yeah. of us can actually take some responsibility, initial responsibility to explore. Suppose Bhutan, I'll explore. Similarly, somebody from Malaysia can just look at uh, from Singapore. So neighbors, they can just try to reach out and. and... Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Go. Uh, no, no problem, Ramit. And what I was trying to point is like maybe we have some participants from Bhutan today already. Yeah. Do and we? As Sabrina, yeah. I don't know. Just wanted to ask if there is someone from Bhutan joining us today. Since unfortunately not. <laughs> so as Ramit suggested, yeah, we can uh, spread these words through our network and try to get more people on board as a board member. Or yes, please. Yes. Anyway, we are going to soon have another board meeting, get the reps together and work. By that time, if you can sort of, Ramesh, fantastic idea, reach out to countries that do not have uh, representatives. So if you can talk to somebody from Bhutan 
I'll work on Singapore and we'll see whether we can sort of make the board rich at, as it used to be sometimes back. Right. Uh, if we do not have any more comments, anything, I would like to end the meeting because uh, I think I must be making Ivan very angry. We were supposed to finish by 10.30. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, There's like a to thank Hello. things that need and you may feel uh, somebody speaking but I can't hear yeah okay uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'd uh, like to thank everybody, Lizia and uh, the ATBC Global, uh, Patricia and Ivan, thank you so much for tolerating all our emails and constant pestering. Thank you, board members and members to be and all the participants. Um, quick meeting, but I hope we achieve what we have to achieve. Looking forward to working with you all. All the best. Stay safe. Take care of yourselves. Thank you very much, Inuka. Thank you, everybody. See you in the afternoon. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.